I'm pleased to introduce um, Dr. Kim Bennell. Let me get my little recording OK button there. Um, um, so many of us are familiar with Kim's work. Um, let me read her official credentials. She is chair of physiotherapy, um, Melbourne, the Melbourne Laureate Professor and Redmond Berry Distinguished Professor in the Department of Physiology at the Melbourne School of Health Sciences. Um, Kim and her colleagues have done really a lot of amazing work around exercise and other lifestyle um, and rehabilitation therapies for knee osteoarthritis, hip osteoarthritis, um, and other things. Um, and so many of us have learned from her work and collaborated with her. And so she's going to be talking to us today specifically about um, digital delivery of osteoarthritis lifestyle care. And we will um, have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, if you would like your, I think you can put questions in the chat anytime if you'd like to do that as well. All right, Kim, whenever you're ready. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Can you see that? It looks great. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, talk to your group. As I said, amazing group. So really good to see you all and hopefully see you in Vienna as well. So I thought I'd just really give an overview of some of the work that we've been doing and some other key uh, research in this area to look at how we can, I suppose, make osteoarthritis lifestyle care more accessible in particular and help support people to, to self-manage. So I don't need to tell you all that these uh, lifestyle management strategies are the core recommended treatments. And so really looking at how we can use some of the different digital um, strategies to help people uptake and engage in uh, you know education exercise physical activity weight management and then other pain self-management strategies and again don't need to emphasize this but we know that that's really key because the these are the the, the top ones that everyone should be doing before they move on but we do have these evidence practice gaps and they're seen worldwide um, you know, in Australia as well as over there as well in different countries that we're just having too much use of medications and joint replacement surgery when inappropriate and not enough of the, the core recommended treatments for a number of reasons I'm not going to go into, don't have the time, but really, you know, patient reasons, clinician reasons and sort of system reasons as well. And so there's a range of different digital technologies and um, we've been looking at, at really at some of these and how they can be useful, their effectiveness as well. So the uh, these digital interventions, they can be fully automated where you can do them self-directed with no need to have a clinician input. You can have some clinician input, use them with clinician input, so remotely in real time or they can be used asynchronously where you're having a chat with the clinician, but it's not at the same time. Uh, they can be combined together in different ways. And you can also blend them with in-person care. So there's a whole range of ways in which the digital interventions can be used clinically to help support lifestyle management. Well, hello, Jeff, as well. <laughs> So firstly, look at the telephone, telephone advantages, readily available, really easy to use. So that, you know, that that's good. It has its advantages, but obviously we don't have the uh, face to fail. That we can't see the, the person on the other end of the telephone. So that could be a problem. Uh, we have done a work that was led by Rana, a study where we looked at telephone delivered exercise care by physiotherapists to see whether that improved pain and function in people with knee osteoarthritis. So they were delivering an exercise program, they're prescribing an exercise program and delivering it all via telephone. So they, what we found was that there were modest benefits for function, but not, 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 not pain at six months. And these weren't maintained at 12 months but a number of the secondary outcomes that also did favour the telephone intervention at six months. So we did see some benefits and it was um, it was able, although our exercise program was able to be delivered by physiotherapists uh, without being able to see the patient. I think what helped was that there was a 
a, a really good resources that were sent to the patient as well and they could use it at home. So when the, the physio said, you know, turn to page six, they could turn to page six and there was the exercise on page six and then they could have a look at it and talk it through there. So they were supplied with some really good resources that could be used to help support the fact that you couldn't see the patient. And what people often say, though, is that, well, if you're consulting by telephone and you can't see the patient, that's obviously going to impair and impact my therapeutic alliance, you know, my relationship with the patient's not going to be as good. But that wasn't the case. We embedded a study where we looked at a therapeutic alliance from the perspective of both the patients and the therapists for but you know, having the care delivered via the telephone. And we still found very high ratings of therapeutic alliance from both the patients and the therapists. So sort of debunking the myth that you can develop up a good rapport with the therapist and, and between the therapist and patient uh, via the telephone. We also asked the, 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 the physios as well as the patients about what they thought about having their, their exercise program delivered via the telephone and um, the qualitative study of a, a subgroup of participants in the trial and, again, came up with themes, and this was the, what, the title of the project. Really, one, one quote was, I was really sceptical but it worked really well. And this is really, and again, I was pleasantly, I was really pleasantly surprised. And I think really that was the overall feeling that people didn't think it was going to work, but was were really surprised with how well it really did work. So again, really I, able to use the telephone if needed to, to deliver care. And so again, the themes that came out was that it was convenient, it was accessible. <laughs> Funnily enough, people found it more personal and seeing the therapist, maybe because they were able to do it in their own home, they felt that it did empower self-management, the therapist in particular, because they weren't able to put their hands on the patient, so they had to empower the patient to self-manage. But people still, even though they, they thought it was good, they still did like and desire sort of visual contact. So that still seems to be important for people, even though it didn't seem to affect the, the rapport that was developed nor the um, their feelings about it. Video conferencing, obviously, uh, widely available as well. We do have the benefit over the telephone of having visual contact, uh, but you do need some level of technical literacy and you can have, you know, people often think, oh, but there's technical issues, you, it's hard to set up and there can be glitches. We recently published a paper looking at how um, frequent technical issues um, are in a, a study where we looked at physio-delivered video conferencing consults. And we actually found that the technical issues were pretty infrequent and they didn't have much impact on, on the consult in terms of the duration of the consult nor um, how much time troubleshooting had to be, had to be spent. So, you know, again, in most cases, the technical issues, even this is with patients who are over the age of 40, so many with an average age of 65 and people into their 80s, that... You know, people can still have these consults and you know do them pretty well. They run pretty well with with few technical issues. Uh, th this was, I suppose, the first study that we did that used the uh, video conferencing to deliver care. Uh, back in published back in two thousand and seventeen, and in this one, we the physios did a prescribed a home exercise program. And we used Skype back in those days, <laughs> back in that, that time, and they did seven consults over three months. We also combined it with, and Frank will be uh, familiar with, with Pain Coach because he developed Pain Coach, so we, we combined it with the patients also doing the online automated pain coping skills training program. And we compared that to a program of, of online education control. And we found that... Um, Sorry, we found that this did lead to improvements in both pain and function and that it was acceptable and, and really well liked by patients. And I suppose that was our first, this was probably our first foray into uh, using digital technologies to deliver care. Uh, in that study, we the previous study, we just delivered exercise care, but uh, a more recent study that we did was also looking at delivering a weight loss program 
via video conference. And we did this one in the private health insurance setting, uh, which a um, bit different to your setting, but we have the public setting, but we also have the private health insurance setting. And we partnered with one of um, Australia's largest private health insurers, Medibank, to look at delivering a combined exercise and weight loss program because their biggest cost driver were knee replacement surgeries and they wanted to see if they could better deliver lifestyle care for their members right across Australia. And so it needed to be something that could be accessible to all. So in this Better Knee, Better Me trial, uh, we had three arms, an education control arm, an exercise and physical activity arm, and they received, similar to the previous study, consults with a physio. This time we used Zoom and they were delivered an exercise and home-based exercise and physical activity program. And then the third group had, they saw the physio via Zoom, but they also undertook a very low calorie ketogenic diet via, um, and they saw the dietitian. And this was really the first study of uh, video conferencing care in um, dietitians as well. And so that trial, both programs led to greater pain relief and improved function and less willingness to consider knee joint replacement surgery than control, which is also important to the health insurer. But the diet plus exercise program led to large weight loss that was largely maintained at 12 months. It was about um, eight, about eight and a half percent weight loss difference between the, the groups, the control group and the diet plus exercise groups. It had small additional pain and function benefits compared to the exercise only, but they also did use less pain medication. So we also looked at the cost effectiveness of the, the, the program, the, the exercise and dietary weight loss programs in that trial. And uh, the, the result really was that we can be 88% confident that the diet plus exercise program was cost effective and 53% confident that the exercise program alone is cost effective compared with control and 86% confident that augmenting exercise with the diet program is cost effective. So some data showing that, and which was important to the health insurer, that there was some, um, you know, that the program was cost effective and, and worthwhile in rolling out. So really great for impact that, that um, health insurer has now rolled out the Better Me, Better Me program to their um, 3,000 members, 3 million members around Australia. And, um, and they've also now adapted it for type 2 diabetes. And uh, we're currently looking at that, uh, a, a trial for the Better Hip study to look at the, a similar program for people with hip OA. So video conferencing in now, you know, with COVID and things, very comf it's very common um, and we know we think that benefits seem to be similar to in person, but in actual fact, there's been really no um, non inferiority head to head comparisons of the two types of care, you know, video conferencing care versus in person care. And we were really thrilled to just have published, led um, by Rana, um, the, a paper in The Lancet uh, just week or so ago, where it was a non-inferiority trial to compare the exact same exercise and physical activity program delivered by physios, either by video consults or in-person consults. And it was set up as a non-inferiority trial. And so they were given, you know, home-based strengthening exercise and physical activity program, education, and sort of printed materials as well. And the key findings were that both video conferencing and in-person care led to improved outcomes at three months and at nine months with no difference in either the change in pain or the change in physical function with the intervention between the, the, the groups. So we established non-inferiority. At three months, adverse events were similar. People often say, yeah, but maybe you get more adverse events, but they were similar for the in-person care uh, and none were serious. The, what you'd expect with an exercise program. But we also saw that video conferencing was superior for the change in a number of uh, secondary outcomes. So it was superior for their change in physical activity at nine months. Actually, really interestingly, superior for the therapeutic alliance from the participants. They 
they felt that there was better rapport uh, when they were do doing the doing it via video conferencing. Again, maybe because they the physios coming to them in their own home, they it was more um, superior for satisfaction, attendance. Uh, adherence to the strength exercise and obviously distance travelled for the consult. So there was a number of benefits for the video conferencing. And this just shows for um, the non-inferiority analysis of the pain and function outcomes, which were our two primary outcomes at three months, which was the primary time point, and then at nine months. You can see here this is the, the grey bar represents our non-inferiority marge or our Gray area re represents the um, non-inferiority zone, and this is the margin here. And you can see that the this is the change in pain and the change in function. And you can see that really they uh, the non-inferior well before it's well above here the non-inferiority margin here for both pain and function, with no difference between the two, with the lines crossing zero here. So that sort of video conferencing care, we've also been looking at uh, web-based resources and programs and looking at ways that we can deliver interventions uh, through the web. Patient education, obviously there's a lot of patient education on the web and if you do a sort of a Google search, you get 241 million hits if you type in osteoarthritis because so there's a lot of information out there. But um, there was work, I think, by Jeff, uh, that led that had looked at some of the quality of the um, websites that are out there and the information and it's not necessarily very high quality so people don't necessarily know where to go there's lots of consumer websites which um, are good because they are much more likely to have the evidence-based um, information and uh, we did a, a study looking at the Arthritis Australia My Joint Pain website which gives a lot of information and support for people to help self-manage and it, we found that it can help improve patient self-management and self-efficacy. And there was a study that came out in 2019 which which ranked the top, looked at the top ranked or they ranked a whole range of, of freely available contemporary pain management websites and they the top ranked of the 27 that they found was the My Joint Pain the Live Plan B, the Pain Canada, and the ACI Pain Management Network. So they they went through and had a look at ones that and that ranked them on a range of different um, criteria. So that paper is, was good to look at. You can use the web obviously to to give uh, information and um, Tor Egerton in our um, group um, developed up a very brief, a ten minute informational video about osteoarthritis and that's on YouTube. And the aim really in this video was for 10 minutes was really to give patients information about what osteoarthritis was or is and to highlight the key recommended treatments, the like key lifestyle treatments, just in, as I said, a 10 minute video. But it was aiming to uh, use language that instilled hope and optimism and avoided all terms around, you know, degeneration and his wear and tear and so forth. So it really focused more on what the patient could do and empowering sort of hope and, uh, and optimism. And uh, she tested that in a clinical trial. You can, the, the little code there at the bottom, you can go to the video if you want to, but it led to improvements in self-efficacy for managing osteoarthritis. Uh, they improved their attitudes to self-management uh, they were more likely to rate physical activity as being important and it also increased their confidence for physical activity. So even a brief 10-minute video uh, can help to uh, you know, improve some of these aspects as well. And we obviously don't just do education as a standalone. It, it goes with our other treatments, but I think that, you know, there's a lot of scope for using web-based information and um, videos and so forth to augment the care. Um, she also did another trial where she, which was really interesting because we always say that we think that, you know, we should be doing this kind of empowerment and participatory discourse, uh, which was the, what the video is based on. So what she then did was she did a randomised controlled trial comparing this video, which was based on the empowerment and participatory discourse, and she compared it with 
a, a video that was the same length, but it really had a focus more on disease and impairment. So, you know, showed what the 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 drawing of the knee with the osteophytes and the joint space narrowing and, and so forth. So it had the same information, but just more delivered in that disease and impairment discourse, which is probably more <clears throat> the traditional way. And she compared those in um, 589 people randomised to watch either of the two videos for the 10 minutes. Uh, we call these trials our um, randomised controlled trials in a day because we use a... Um, a company where you can just they advertise and they recruit you know 589 people in a few days and then they finish the the study in a in a week so we love these randomized control trials but anyway in this one what she found was that the video that was based on this empowerment and participatory discourse improved pain self-efficacy and reduced uh, fear of movement or kinesiophobia more than a video based on disease and impairment discourse so really providing some evidence to support that the language we use as well and what we say and show does make a difference. So, you know, really being mindful of the material that we use for our education and the words that we say in our, in our discourse. Now, because there's so much uh, information out there that's not necessarily evidence-based, uh, um, Rachel Nelligan in our group uh, worked with patients to co-design a... Um, online patient education course. As I said, there's a lot of material out there, but we wanted a really, a much more detailed course. So this is a, a course that goes over four modules. It's free. And so it really focused again on those lifestyle management um, aspects. So week one, all about learning about OA, week two, physical activity and exercise, week three, body weight, and then week four, additional strategies. It's been it's in English, but also it's in simplified Chinese as well for for patients. You can access it there. And uh, what she did was complete a clinical trial of the this course, and she found that the course did improve, um, as we'd hoped, osteoarthritis knowledge. And she's um, just submitted that for publication now, but that's the protocol there. So. Um, there's this course that's available out there. As I said, it's um, it gives about sort of four hours or more of learning, so much more detailed, obviously, than a 10-minute video, but, again, could be used to sort of supplement the, um, the, the treatment that you give because, obviously, we don't have time. Clinicians are often busy uh, and it's not necessarily you don't have the time to give really detailed information. And now she's also currently looking at whether adding the course to a physio prescribed exercise program is um, provides greater benefits than just the you know the, the physio program and the, the education that you might get in a in a half hour consult whether it improves outcomes. So other web based programs, uh, Rachel also for her PhD looked at. Um, a fully self-directed web-based strengthening exercise and physical activity program um, supported by automated text messages because great to be able to see the clinician, but not everybody is able to do that. They may not have the funds to, to go and see a physio or they may not be one available in their area or they may not have access. So, you know, some um, self-support, uh, some self-directed Programs are, uh, can be good because you can make them freely available. And so she um, set up My Knee Exercise. It's a six-month online program, and, we, and she compared that to online education in 206 people with knee OA, found that there was significantly greater improvements in pain and function in the two groups, uh, and that 72% in the intervention group reached the MCID in terms of changes in pain versus 42% in the control group. And for function, 68% of the intervention group had a clinically relevant improvement in function compared to 41% in the control. So you know, a fully self-directed with no therapist input um, program can be beneficial for patients. And as I said, that's been really now well accessed by people around the world, been made freely available. And I think it's had you know, about 40,000 people access that at the moment, which is great. So based on that, that was a strengthening program. 
we also thought, well, let's look at some developing some other programs because it's uh, really good for patients to have choice and, you know, they might get sick of their strengthening program after six months, want something different. So we developed up a, an online, a three-month online yoga program, again, self-directed, made to look like a class setting, but you could do it in your own home. And again, we tested that in a clinical trial, found that it had it didn't improve pain, but it did improve function more than the, the control group, which was online education. So, again, that's freely available if you want to check out myjointyoga.com.au. Uh, uh, and, again, as I said, just another option for patients to, to try. Some people you know, like to do, to do yoga. So adding, and as I said, we've made that freely available. Adding to our suite of um, online exercise programs that are self-directed um, and evidence-based, we're currently testing my hip exercise that's based on the my knee exercise. So this is a strengthening program for people with hip pain and hip osteoarthritis. Uh, so again, we're in the middle of a clinical trial looking at um, that strengthening program for hip and again, what we've done is uh, we're testing again, middle of a, an RCT run by a, one of our PhD students, Julia, and she has put together with patients and with uh, Tai Chi instructors a free, well, it's got to, it will be made freely available, but it's a 12-week Tai Chi program. And she did a really nice job, uh, Julia Zhu did a really nice job of developing up the Tai Chi program through a, a process of co-design where got the experts together, looked at what of the different movements of Tai Chi might be suitable to deliver over video, uh, as well as might be suitable for people with hip and knee osteoarthritis as well as safe to do. And then it was put through sort of like a Delphi process as well and then came up with the um, with the, the program and then it was filmed. Uh, she filmed it in, in the studios. Well, it was filmed in the studios at Melbourne Uni and now she's currently running an RCT on that as well. So, again, I think, you know, not Tai Chi is not for everybody, but, again, hopefully uh, it can be shown to be beneficial for people and, again, another sort of option for people to try. Now, online programs don't just have to be exercise and pain coping skills training came from Frank. So Frank developed up with Christine Rinney, taking from his face-to-face -face program that involved a therapist. But obviously, again, that's hard. You need trained therapists to deliver the pain coping skills training program. But they took the elements, the elements that they felt were critical and um, converted that into an online program. It's now called Pain Trainer. It was Pain Coach, but it's changed Pain Trainer. And eight, it consists of eight lots of 45-minute modules, and research has shown that that can reduce pain levels and the number of maladaptive behavioural strategies that people use, also positive user experiences. So um, you can access... Pain Trainer via paintrainer.org if you like the Australian accent. That's the Australian accent, the avatar with the Australian accent. But if you like the US accent, you can go to mypaintrainer.org. So um, because it was funny that the we had it in when we tested it in our one of our trials, some of the feedback was because the original one was in, uh, you know, had a the person from the States and our, our one uh, Feedback was, oh, look, we really like to hear someone with an Australian accent. <laughs> so uh, everyone likes to hear their own. <laughs> so we recorded it with a with an Australian accent as well. So you can have options. So there's you can uh, you you can this is again freely available. So a, a a good resource. I think a lot of people can not necessarily for everyone, but an option that people can try and they can learn different skills that they may be able to use, find the one that suits them the most and you know, incorporate that into their strategies that they can have up their sleeve to help them deal with pain. So these fully automated web-based OA self-management interventions that I've sort of gone through, that um, been involved with, 
They can be used as standalone treatments and certainly, you know, many people are just accessing them and using them as standalone treatments. But they can also be the sort of first step in a management approach. So people use them before they need to step up care and that's great because it's free. And obviously, you know, you're aware of Kelly's great work and this study was really nice where that's really what they did. They used a, as step one the automated internet-based exercise program and people did that before they needed to, if, or if they needed to, then they could step up to something where there was a therapist input. And you could see that 35% that of people didn't need to go up to step two because that automated uh, exercise program on the web was enough for them. So it's really nice, I think, that you can incorporate these strategies and these um, interventions in different ways in clinical care. Uh, they can also be blended, uh, you know, you can use them as blended interventions with the clinician input. And that's what we've found um, has worked in clinical practice as well, where patient um, clinicians have said, well, I, you know, I see the patient and then I say to them, you know, why don't you try the the pain trainer, uh, go away, and then they come back and they say, you know, how did you go with pain trainer? How you do? So they can help support the patient to do them as well. Uh, so that you have some clinician input to as well as, incorporating these interventions. So if we look at now there's, you know, mobile apps and SMS and wearable devices as well there's, that can be uh, used to, to help deliver and support. Even if they don't deliver the interventions, they can help support engagement and adherence to those interventions. So um, as I said, they can be used to not only deliver interventions, but you can use them to increase adherence. They can be used to track symptoms they can be used to communicate with the healthcare team. So there's lots of different ways in which these can be used. Uh, there was a study that came out uh, that um, with Alison Chang's group where they assessed the mobile health apps. They went through the, the Apple App Store and the Google Play and Amazon and so forth, and they identified, they looked at apps that could support um, you know, individuals with hip and knee OA, and they found about... Well, they identified a number of apps but found sort of 94 that met their inclusion exclusion criteria and then they appraised those for their quality and they found that, you know, most of the apps, the majority of the apps didn't meet their predetermined score threshold. So they, they weren't necessarily high quality. They failed to deliver comprehensive education or management plans and they lacked scientific testing. So there's sort of apps out there but they haven't necessarily been developed uh, in a way that's evidence-based or tested as well. So, um, you know, scope for improvement in, the, in what we've got out there. So digital technologies can also be used to increase physical activity levels and promote weight loss. And these are systematic reviews looking at the, these in not necessarily people with OA, but in, in adults. So, you know, using wearable devices to track your step count SMS is to help support, as I said, apps to, to help as well. We uh, used a um, web slash app-based exercise programming system to deliver exercises. At, back in my, my day when I was a physio, uh, this is on the left there, I would draw my, you know, the diagram for the, the patient. Here's your exercises. And so the traditional method really is, you know, your, your pen and paper drawings, handouts but there's a lot of exercise programming systems now, which are really great. They have videos and you can send them to the person's phone and you can set up the set, the reps and sets and, and individualise it. So we sort of tested the traditional method of prescribing the exercise to the web -based ex uh, to a web-based exercise programming system, uh, did a randomised controlled trial. Both groups received a home strengthening exercise program that they were asked to do um, sorry, um, that was the next one I was going on to. This one where we tested it, we did find that the exercise programming system improved their adherence to exercise. So, you know, they can be effective to help support adherence. Similarly, we looked at the uh, behaviour change text messages uh, and saw whether they could increase home exercise adherence. And uh, these behaviour change text messages weren't simply reminders about exercise. They were looking at 
addressing the barriers and the facilitators to exercise that we know that people with osteoarthritis have. And it was based on the behaviour change wheel and uh, it dealt, gave them semi-personalised messages when they responded to why they hadn't done the exercises that week, what were the barriers, and they might have said, oh, ran out of time or lack of time. It then did a behaviour change text message that, that was specific to that because, you know, forgetting is only one barrier. So sending a reminder message to do the exercise, forgetting is only one barrier to exercise. So people may not necessarily forget, but there are a whole range of other reasons they're not doing their exercise. So addressing all of those different reasons. So we developed up this behaviour change text message program. And then in an RCT, we compared whether that was effective. Both groups received a home exercise program that they're asked to do three times a week. And then one group had this text message um, program added to it. And we did find that that increased their home exercise adherence over six months. And because text messages are uh, it was harder to roll out that program because then someone has to sort of pay for the text messages and, and set it all up. We decided to create it, in to convert it into an app. So we've converted the text message program into an app called My Exercise Messages. It's freely available in the Apple Store and Google Play. We're currently just testing this in a clinical trial. But the app... Uh, doesn't prescribe an exercise program. What it does is if they've got an exercise program already prescribed or they want to do their exercise you know, three times a week or their, their physical activity plan three times a week or four times a week, what it does is it helps support them do the exercise program that they've been prescribed or that they want to do. So what it asks them to do is to so how many days that they set the target of how many exercise days they want to do so you, you set your target or this person wants to exercise, you know, do their exercise sessions three times a week. And then at the end of the week, it asks them what made it. So they put in what they actually did at the end of the week. So this person didn't reach their target of their three exercises or their four exercises a week. They only did three exercises a week, three exercise sessions. So then it asks them what made it hard for you to do all of your four exercise sessions last week. And then they choose from a drop-down menu. So this person said they were, they were worried the exercises were harming their knee. So then it comes back with a, a message that is tailored to that particular barrier, uh, just a, a brief message. It also allows them to track their exercise days. So um, so as I said, that's freely available um, for, for patients to, to use to help them adhere to their exercise program. So we've got a lot of research. We want it to obviously you know, be implemented, all this, the work that's being done um, and looking at how digital care can be um, implemented. So we do need to build up the evidence, looking not only at clinical but cost effectiveness. Also patient selection, you know, who, what, when. Uh, it's not necessarily for everybody and some things will suit some and not others. So, you know, it's not we're going to replace our normal face-to-face -face care, but <clears throat> looking at who's going to be best and what is going to suit them best. I think they'd be really good to, they can be really great to help uh, harness the behaviour change techniques that we want to employ. So I think we can really better incorporate behaviour change techniques into our digital interventions. We need to train clinicians. So uh, obviously COVID had it really rapidly forced people to shift to delivering their care remotely. So they, you know, they've got a lot more skilled, but training clinicians to deliver care in uh, using digital techniques is important as well. And so we have put a lot of our training programs online for people to, to use. And this was the PEAK program. Uh, and this trains people to deliver an exercise and physical activity program to for, for NEOA. So it, it outlines sort of five consults, gives a lot of patient digital resources and exercise videos. And we've made it available in Spanish, Portuguese and simplified Chinese as well as English. And we've evaluated that uh, the course in some, some research that uh, is at the bottom there. So... Uh, Again, we can train clinicians digitally as well as about digital interventions. 
so we can harness the the um, you know the, these technologies to to reach more people in terms of training clinicians. So if you're interested in the course, you can go along there. Uh, similarly, along those lines, we also found that uh, our work found that clinicians weren't necessarily very confident in delivering um, education or uh, about weight loss, weight management. Um, so, for example, we looked at physios. They weren't very confident in bringing it up, sort of a bit unsure about how they should bring up, uh, you know, weight management and uh, so forth. So we also uh, put together a free online training course about uh, weight management. We originally did it for adult patients with osteoarthritis and for physios, but then it was really, we thought it was re relevant to, you know, chronic disease. The, the, all the skills were relevant for any of our patients with chronic disease where weight management is important as well as not just physios. So we rolled out the program to, we broadened it. So the EduWeight program, um, we put that on to Future Learn. It's got six modules and we tested that in a randomised controlled trial of, of um, whether physios you know, doing the course, whether it changed their confidence in being able to deliver weight management for people with osteoarthritis. And in that trial, we found that it certainly improved their confidence and also in, it improved their confidence in their knowledge and their skills and nutrition care, but it also reduced weight stigma in the physios, which is really important because we know that many clinicians, even though they think they may not have it, they do dis um, display weight stigma. So it was able to reduce um, weight stigma in the, the therapists as well. So um, really good to be able to use digital resources for our training of clinicians. Obviously, we need to break habits. People get used to delivering care in certain ways. And um, so, you know, setting up new ways of delivering care um, requires us to change the system, change uh, as well what we might be doing. I think reimagining the role of the clinician has been, um, is important, but it goes alongside with sort of it needs to be changing funding and reimbursement if we're going to change how care was. And again, COVID was, that was probably what COVID did in that it, you know, care delivered remotely wasn't funded over here for for many of the different professions and now they it got re or got introduced over COVID and it's been remained since COVID where there's now funding for care delivered uh, via video conferencing and telephone. So, you know, that's really important as well. And as I said, I think, the, you know, COVID did provide an opportunity to better incorporate, sorry, there was a mozzie just flew across in front of me, <laughs> uh, to embrace the opportunity that um, that that this sort of the digital interventions provide us. So in summary, uh, technologies can certainly help support both the uptake and adherence to a range of these uh, lifestyle interventions, exercise, weight loss, and other self-management treatments. They can be standalone or blended with in-person care, and then they have benefits, but also some limitations. So we really do need a patient-centered approach as to decide who, when and how the technology is going to be used. Uh, our website, our Chesham website, we've got um, a lot of patient resources there, clinician resources. We've got all the studies that we're currently doing, plus all of our study results and infographics for each of the studies. If you're interested, there you can check that out. We also have our own knowledge translation network that you can join where you um, receive sort of information about the work we're doing. Um, and as I said, here's some a summary of some of those key patient resources and clinician resources as well, a few that I didn't mention. And really a huge thanks to the team that we have at the Centre for Health Exercise and Sports Medicine, which I co-lead the OA group with Rana Hinman, but really great group who do all the hard work and um, you know, yeah, do some great work and great to work with and our funders. So thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to your group. So I might stop sharing there now. All right, thank you, Kim. That was amazing. I'm guessing that others are similarly thinking um, as I am, that that's just an amazing body of work. And I know you're 
supported by such a great team there. Um, I think um, I'm particularly impressed by the um, combination of the great science and all of the great um, kind of dissemination of tools you all have done. It's been, um, I know benefited many. I'm looking at the chat. I don't think I see any. Um, okay, I see one from Frank. Can you talk about any ethical issues or challenges that arise in the context of your digital health treatments? Yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, I think some of the challenges are, um, well, obviously, with some of the, the apps and so forth around uh, data privacy. So if you are collecting, you know, if you want people to input information into the, the programs, there's obviously regulations around uh, data security and um, privacy. So that I think is something that's really important. Um, we've now, we've tended not to um, collect personal information on the these so that there's not the issue, but that, that certainly is, and people are much more wary now of your know, aspects around that with data, their data getting out, their personal information getting out. So I think that's one issue. I think another um, issue is around, is around safety and ensuring that they're, uh, you know, the, the safety when people are doing uh, these interventions, particularly if they're self-directed. So um, legal, you have to have the legal disclaimer uh, there to, to, you know, to make sure that people um, understand that they're doing this on their own. But also I think having some boundaries around um, inclusion, exclusion criteria, who is this suitable for and when might you need to go and get some input from a, a health professional so that um, people can, you know, make sure that it is going to be safe to do uh, as well. Um, I think, as again, when we have these technologies, we also want to make sure we're not um, increasing care disparities. Uh, you know, that yes, okay, that we can increase access, but on the other hand, maybe <clears throat> people don't have access to the to the internet or the you know the the technologies that they need to 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 undertake. So we don't want to we want to make sure that the care disparities and um, you know we're not we're not increasing those rather than decreasing them. So I think that's something to really to to look out for as well. Um, uh, Frank, were there any adverse events particularly related to e-health? No, I mean really we um, we haven't really had any you know, serious uh, related adverse events in any of the trials that have, they've all been what you expect in, you know, similar trials that we do with face-to-face. -face. And in the, the Lancet study that we did, the non-inferiority comparing head in person and video conferencing, there was not any difference in the, the adverse events there as well. Uh, but I think we do, obviously, in clinical trials, we you screen out people that may not be suitable so as I said, I think that is important to make people aware that, you know, um, so for example, we're currently translating the very low calorie ketogenic diet into a self-directed program. And so we need to have some boundaries around that and thinking about if we roll it out, you know, how we would do that to make that done in a safe way. I and mean, obviously people can just go to their pharmacy or the chemist and buy meal replacements and do it themselves. But Still in our trials, we exclude people with type 1 diabetes and, um, you know, with renal issues. So, again, having a clear, you know, maybe they fill in some uh, dot you know, questionnaire that says, have you got this, have you got that, have you got this? Well, then, no, this program's not going to be suitable for you or, no, you need to go and check with your, your healthcare provider to make sure this is suitable, I think. So, so really making it clear for people who and who it is and isn't suitable for. Lee, some of the programs have reached large numbers. How do you disseminate the program so broadly? Are you partnering with a voluntary health organisation or the government? Yeah, look, thanks, Lee. Um, we we do have a – we decided to put some resources into one of our research assistants whose job it is to really help drive impact because, as you said, you can build it but they don't necessarily come to the – you know, that field of dreams, if you build it, they'll come. That's not necessarily the case. You can have these great resources, but no one knows about them and doesn't, doesn't use them. So um, we have – and also I think the other thing that helps with dissemination is that they're free. If we – you know, we always get 
this tension with the with, often with the universities that oh you should be making money from these resources and so forth. But as soon as you do that, people are less likely to disseminate the information for you. So because we, we send it around to um, physio organisations around the world, we, we've got our on our newsletter, our knowledge translation newsletter, we've got about you know, ten thousand people on that. But people are much more likely to disseminate the information if the programs are free. So we have found, we believe that they're and it was with Frank has very much had the same ethos that if they're being funded by taxpayer money, you know, through grants and things, that we should be making them sort of available to people more broadly. So I think that helps as well, making the resources free. But we do spend time, um, you know, letting different organisations know. But it's also I think helped when we publish the paper to have the link to the resource already there and available because people, when they read the paper, they can see immediately that's the resource. So that's helped as well. And I think it's just been sort of, I don't know, it's sort of word of mouth. It's just it's been it's been great. It has sort of got around quite widely. But some of you, we still need to push uh, to try and get them out there. But, yes, it's a good way. Isn't it? It's a good question. You, you, you spend all this time and effort with resources and then they, you know, they got to get them we've got to spend time and effort as well to disseminate not to sort of put them out there and think they're going to be used so yeah I think putting some resources toward that's important um Jeff okay um, have you got any negative reactions from the physios in the community who might fear that virtual treatments compete with them oh the non-directed ones um no, look, you know, I think some you know, some people, it's a good question. We probably have had some that think we're doing a lot that's, um, you know, not not, phys not clinician related. There's a lot of free resources out there. But as I said, I think a lot of the physios are instead uh, using those resources to help augment what they do. So rather than seeing them as competing, they can use them to help their own treatment and they can suggest to patients a whole raft of different resources that are out there, not just our resources, but other great resources as well that are out there. So they, I think they've really embraced them and, and been blending them into their care, which they've seen as advantageous. So, so yes, Jeff, Kurt, Jeff Curtis brings up a really good point. I agree with the goal of making the resources freely available. It does cost money to sustain and continue to host, yes, um, even if one takes the profit conversation off the table. Any thoughts on how to best support maintenance and hosting costs in ongoing fashion for resources developed with public money? You're, you're totally right because, you know, there's an update by, you know, some, and then it, suddenly it doesn't work anymore We have with the app. The, there seems to be some updates and now the um, Android doesn't seem to work that well on the Android at the moment, Android users at the moment. So we're having to get the <laughs> technicians in. I think what we've tried to do is with the monies that we we get from our research, recognise that we'll just have a portion that gets put away to to do exactly what you've said, to help maintain those, um, those, in, those resources. And um, just like we have money, we, we have to pay for the staff, statistics support just to have some of that money put away to keep the resources ongoing so we can make them free. So, but, yeah, it, it is a good point and certainly it does cost money. You know, um, but we try and do it um, in a way that's less. So we, for example, our web-based programs are all done on the university sort of server so that they can help support it which is much cheaper than if we had an external provider so sort of looking at ways to to so I think you made a good point not don't just develop the resource but think about the future you know is this going to be sustainable or how are we going to make it sustainable you know what happens if we run out of money <laughs> what's what's going to happen so I think they're really good thoughts in the planning as well moving forward Can I ask a question? Yes. Kim, your your career has really spanned quite the gamut, you know, going from single interventions to multimodal interventions and digital health and incorporating now. The first time I've heard you talk about uh, implementation science, which is, you know, just so impressive. And I guess my question is, 
is that a reflection on your your thought of where we need to go as a field and, and namely perhaps not so much looking at single modalities or single interventions but more moving towards you know implement implementing all the great resources we have or or do you feel like there needs still needs to be work in in all these different areas i'm, I'm just curious on your perspective for that yeah thanks dan no i think i think we need all of them i think the you know we need it across the whole scope we still need to to look at you know, are the interventions we're doing you know effective efficacious we need those we need that research as well and we need to look at mechanisms as well mechanistic research underpinning and what what how we, we still don't know for example we've had all these debates you know how is exercise having an effect and what is are the effects so we still need all that research and then we sort of need the other end as well of the of the implementation of what we know works so i think we need all of it um and you know we've just i suppose we've just seen some opportunities and um, moved with those it's been fantastic because you keep learning you, you know we go okay now we'll do some behavior change work Ooh, we've never done behavior change you know that's all new to us and then or the implementation science, that's sort of newer as well. So always continue to learn and then you can work with good people in those areas. And now the, the big thing for us that we're getting more into is the co-design because, you know, co-design's now got its own methodologies around, you know, it's not just taking a patient or two and getting their opinion. There's sort of methodologies around co-design and, you know, different theories and, and frameworks around that as well. So now we're kind of work with people to say how can we better use co-design methods to to um you know to design the interventions as well so always learning and lots of i think as your answer the answer to your question is i think we need all of it thank you all right we're about at time but there's still one more question from lee um can you comment a little bit on the education of clinicians um so maybe we'll hang on for another minute or two if folks are able to um for that yeah question yeah so it's just said like are you offering them cmes or how do you get them to do it and then do they really refer you know yeah. take the next step yeah look at um we don't offer cme because you've got to do like filling lots of different but they're all different for every different you know, collision so no we don't but um we we and you're right what you do is you sort of test uh, their confidence in their knowledge and their confidence in their skills, which is not the same as actually testing their skills and whether they then roll it out into clinical practice because that's obviously a lot harder to do. So, you know, you're, you're hoping that if you do train them up, they will employ it and, and, and use it in their practice. So that next step of research to see whether they are actually doing that is we haven't done a lot of that one um, to, to be sort of fair. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> yeah, this has been great. We appreciate everybody attending. If you can, please fill out the survey before you log out. Um, Kim, thanks again, and particularly thanks for joining us early in the morning, your time. No it's problem. Hi, all in um, Vienna, and thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Uh,